Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of How I Got In. I'm your host Karina. This week we're talking about Barnard College and how to get in. This week our guest is Claire. Welcome Claire. Hi, how are you doing Karina? I'm great. Now Claire, Barnard's a bit of a smaller school and it's in New York City. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So it's actually a rather complicated situation with Columbia University. So it's officially Barnard College of Columbia University. And Barnard is one of the smaller undergraduate schools under the larger Columbia umbrella that happens to be an all-woman liberal arts college. So essentially we're right across the street. We're at 116th and Broadway and we have full access to all of the Columbia courses. We have full access to all of their majors just as they have full access to all of ours. So it really is almost a joint venture moving forward in the undergraduate realm, which is very, very interesting when a lot of students here come to Barnard because it is an all-women's college. Others don't even think about it. For example, I did not have it on my radar upon applying, but it ended up being a really formative part of my education and my college career in general. No, it's interesting. Now we'll go more back to the college part of our interview later on, but let's go back and look at what you did in high school. As far as, you know, your academic-wise, you know, everyone's freshman year, it's either you're going easy or starting out strong and you continue going out strong. How did your freshman year look academic-wise? I went to Oyster Bay High School on Long Island, and that's a very, very small school as well, so clearly there was a theme in my life with the smaller schools. And what that meant is that in this high school, we actually had from 7th to 12th grade, so obviously most high schools starting in ninth grade, it was a relatively interesting transition into my freshman year of high school. I took the route of starting out as strongly as possible just because I was really excited about the classes that were offered and I really wanted to push myself in every direction possible to start understanding where it was that my academic mind wanted to roam. No, oh, interesting. Um, were you taking AP classes your freshman year? Not my freshman year. I don't think they offered AP classes for my freshman year at Oyster Bay. We started that one up sophomore year, I believe, where we had one or two of them. But freshman year, you had those advanced, pla not advanced placement, but advanced courses, rather, that kind of fed you into the AP track. All right, all right. Now, your sophomore year, were you able to take any of those AP classes that were offered at Oyster Bay, or were you still in the advanced courses? I was able to jump into the AP classes, which was a lot of fun. And it's just a different way of thinking in general because it moves at a different speed. They are targeted towards college education for certain classes. So I really loved all of my AP courses and kind of ran full blown through those through most of my high school career. What courses were those that you took? So as a sophomore I was in AP World History and AP Bio, both of which were a lot of fun. And then into my junior year we jumped into more of the math. So we had statistics and we had the beginning of Calc AB and it was either language or lit, but I believe it was AP language. And then senior year, I jumped into my final few where we added on physics, we added on chem, we added on lit, and maybe one or two others that I don't fully recall at this point in my life, but there definitely were a lot of them that I was able to take advantage of, which was great. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah, a lot. It was fun. It was fun. <laughs> now, it's so like one of your first AP classes with AP biology. That's easily one of the hardest exams given by the um, college board. I took it. I struggled with it. I was like, about science. I'm not, it's not our thing. How did you do taking that as one of your first AP classes? It was a shock. It was a wake-up call, I think, because entering high school, you very quickly can think that you're on top of the world. And for a lot of us, we happen to be, especially when we're starting to look at what it is we want to do and move forward. And this was a really big wake-up call for me that I, I needed to figure out how to study. And that's actually one of the biggest skills that I've learned through that course. I figured out how I think, how to study through it. And that has been invaluable even here in college because it's from, honestly, that class that I figured out quite a bit how it is that I work and how to move forward with my information. I was the same way. I learned how to study in that class. I learned that I was a visual learner because the entire year I had gone through, the teacher was very much auditory based, so everything was auditory. But once one time she showed a video of how, like, a, I forgot what it was, some cell process worked, <laughs> and all of a sudden it just clicked. I'm like, oh my god, I get it. And right. that's when I started, you know, I, when I was studying, my study process became a lot more in depth where I would create images, I'd draw stuff out, charts, to help me remember stuff like that. And I was, my grades improved significantly after that. And yeah. it's funny that you learned in that class too, but. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So I actually, I'm very jealous of that because I have zero artistic ability of whatsoever. And for me, drawing things out and being visual is not as helpful. I figured out very early on that I needed to handwrite my notes. For whatever reason, there's a connection between my pen and my brain. So I would go to class initially trying to be a cool, you know, high schooler with my laptop, which 
very quickly fell when I understood that that wasn't how I learned. So that would actually also be one of my biggest pieces of advice to the high schoolers out there. Figure out how you study now because you really won't have time to do that once you enter the college circuit. You're just going to kind of have to hit the ground running and make sure that you're able to process the information that's being thrown at you at a rather quick pace. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Like, I my, I mean, as I've been in college, I've kind of, you know, I've adapted a little bit, you know, to speed it up along, so I don't have, you know, a whole mm -hmm. lot of time to study like I used to in high school. Right, but it is right. Interesting, you know, and I think with anything, you know, if, um, in my English class in high school, they taught us how to annotate books, like, mm -hmm. like literature books, and I've applied that through everything that I do now. I annotate everything, like my books, like I can't even resell them anymore. <laughs> There's just notes everywhere. But as you write it down, you start to remember stuff, and I think that applies for a majority of people, and I think that's why it's taught in high schools is to do that, because it helps you retain what you're reading, instead right. of just kind of glazing over and saying, oh, I get it, sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And everyone does it a little bit differently. So I'm currently a senior here at Barnard, and I'm majoring in philosophy of language, so I deal with words and literature and really intense academia that just gets thrown at you 24-7. And I have some peers that are phenomenal at being able to read something on a screen and picking it up. Whereas I just need to print it out. I need it in hard copy in front of me. So it, it really it changes on who it is. I am 100% with you on annotation, though. I need it in front of me, and I need to write on it the second I process when it's being read. Yeah, no. Now, um, you go into your junior year, you have, a majority of people are starting to take the SAT and the ACT, and there's also the PSAT your sophomore year. Did you take the PSAT your sophomore year? I did take the PSAT. So the PSAT was actually mandatory over at Oyster Bay. And that was actually a really great thing because what happened is based on how you scored on your PSAT, they would offer you free classes from Oyster Bay in order to kind of start getting a handle on what your SAT should look like. Now, granted, these free classes were nowhere near all that one would need when studying for such an exam, but they were a really good insight into figuring out where you might need the most work, uh, which was really nice. So I got placed into a class from there and then pretty much started studying for my SATs right after I took the PSAT. Wow, that's insane, but it's great that your high school provided a class to help you prepare for it, because mm -hmm. it is time consuming, and there are, you know, there's private tutors out there, there's all these different resources that you can do, but it costs money, yes. and, you know, not money's not always available all the time. Exactly, so. exactly. Though I think the PSAT is a really good tool to kind of start gauging where it is that you fall in the realm of the SAT world, as well as starting to figure out, well, I might have a skill in this particular set, whereas this one kind of falls or lags behind compared to everything else. And then that's where you can really focus most of your energy because a lot of high school students, their time's filled. They're super busy running eight clubs and being in charge of X amount of sport teams. So you really have to start figuring out and prioritizing how much time can I actually devote to doing this without dropping all of the things that I'm passionate about. Yeah, no, I, I was there. I had a separate planner for everything I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was a bit crazy, but... um. When you look at the SAT and the ACT, did you have a preference over the two, or did you just refine in both? So I took both of them, and I performed much more strongly in my ACTs, which was not a shocker for me in general, though. I kind of knew that's how it worked, because the SAT is less of a time game and more of just let's test every piece of information you have, whereas the ACT is much more of a time game. How quickly can you think? And so I knew that I would be fine with the ACT at that point. The SAT... I mean, both of them are difficult, though, don't get me wrong. There's no easier exam. It just plays to different strengths. So I took both of them, and I ended up submitting both scores to all of the schools that I applied to, just because I figured it can't hurt. If we have them both, might as well submit them in. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it depends on the person. I mean, I was more of an ACT person, but there mm -hmm. are a majority of my friends actually did both. They were fine with both. And I was. It just it really does depend on the person. Now, right. how early on did you start taking the SAT and the ACT? So that one's, I only took the exam twice. I took the exam, both exams, once relatively blind. So the beginning study after the PSAT, what I was doing, we were just kind of started dabbling here and there to get a feel for what the exam would consist of in the real world of its version. And then took an exam blind from there, ended up doing decently, so decided that, well, if I actually study and take this thing again, that would be awesome. Uh, because that was I was applying in the year where everything was either being super scored or it was a top score choice. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but there was essentially nothing to lose by taking this thing multiple times. And so from there, I, the second I took it, I started studying a lot more, and then I took it again 
I'd like to say somewhere mid to end junior year. I took it early just because I wanted to get the scores out of the way and really focus on my application. And I knew by the time senior year hit, and it's a very real thing, you start being nostalgic and wanting to be social and hanging out with friends. And your, your academics can become a secondary type of priority for you, which is not necessarily what it should be and should not be the case. However, I wanted to account for that early on in and have my scores be at the prime of my studying time. No, I think I think that's honestly the way to go because I mm -hmm. took it in the beginning of my senior year. I took it once at the end of junior year, and then I started took like tw two more times during my senior year, mm -hmm. and that was chaotic. You know, I'm trying to study for this thing. I've got 12 applications to send out. I've got five AP classes to worry <laughs> about. I've got a yearbook to have to worry about, and it was crazy. It's absolutely crazy, and I, my scores probably could have been better if I take taken the time during my junior year to prepare for it. And exactly. that's something I definitely regret doing. I think how you did it is the perfect way to go about it. You know, mm -hmm. get it done your junior year, get it out of the way, get your scores ready to go, and that's 10 pounds off your shoulder right off the bat. It's, it's huge, because it also starts to dictate where it is that you can look at for school. So that was, once I took the exams, that's when I started doing a lot of the research for the schools that I could get into based on where the range of my scores fell. Because otherwise, you, you don't want to start applying to schools that, you know, don't fall with your range, or schools that wouldn't challenge you, or schools that would just challenge you to a point that that's not what you're looking for in your college career. So that was also a really good indicator for me to start figuring out where to apply. No, I completely agree. Uh, now, going into your senior year, you've got your SAT and your ACT done. You've got, you know, your senior year, nostalgic senior year coming at you. Um, and then you've got your college applications. And that's just a whole other world of its own. How do you approach that? Again, what Oyster Bay did, which was really phenomenal. So the way that the Oyster Bay high school timeline worked is they were 40-minute periods. We had nine of them with a three-minute interval, which, side note, just in general with a little note to college, this concept of a three minute interval is ridiculous because that is the most random number I've ever heard of in my entire life. <laughs> but anyway, in high school that's apparently acceptable. So three minute intervals between classes to get back and forth and one of those 40 minute periods was a mandatory class for all seniors called college writing. And what that was, it was 40 minutes in a computer lab where you can just work on applications, which was phenomenal because 40 minutes doesn't sound like a lot but when you're motivated and you have something to get done that's really all the time you need and so what I started doing was taking that 40 minute class period and then a half hour at home just to make sure that I work about an hour a day and that that's actually a huge amount of time down the line because it, it adds up if you do it every day and if you're consistent with it and that's really how I was able to approach it so Oyster Bay kind of forced me to approach it methodically which was great <laughs> Hey, I had something like that. It was called Ace Photography, mm -hmm. and my computer was not facing the teacher, and that's when I did my application. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost the same thing. It was almost the same. <laughs> I had like my resume and my um, um, mm -hmm. essays on my thumb drive, and I would just you know wait for her to, and then have like Photoshop minimize, and then she'd come up, put Photoshop up real quick. But I mean, I'd always finish my projects really fast and get it done with, because right. other people would just kind of dilly dally around, and then I just get going on my applications and. That's the majority of what I did. <laughs> but that's great that your high school did that. I mean, I would have loved to have a designated hour during my day mm -hmm. to be able to say, okay, I can't do anything else but this, so I need to get right. it done. Because there were right. some applications where I left last minute and I regretted it. Yeah, it's hard. Essentially, anytime you start rushing, you're going to get sloppy with what you're saying. You're not going to get to actually think about what voice you are presenting through your writing, which is really, really important for colleges in general. And that's something I didn't fully realize until... Now here at Barnard, I'm actually a senior interviewer, so I'm interviewing high school seniors as they're coming through to apply through to Barnard. And the amount of emphasis that we place on who the person is, I was blown away by. And I thought, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's really important. And that's just something to keep in mind in general in writing any type of application, even for law school apps for myself now. It, it changes how I think about what I'm writing, knowing this now. Yeah, no, I completely agree. You know, people have to remember that you're just so much more than a number. You're more than your your class ranking. You're more than your SAT number, your ACT number, or whatever place you came in in your track final. <laughs> it is, you know, it is depending on who you are. And a lot of you know the private, small private colleges, they have the liberty to look at who you are. Right. And, you know, what makes you tick? What makes you think? And you know, I wish I could have you know had that experience to go to a college like that because that would have mm -hmm. been cool to have a college that appreciates me for who I am besides you know my statistics. Right. Um, but you know, it's also interesting to see that you have um, that you're doing interviews of mm -hmm. high school seniors now, and that's an interesting approach because I haven't heard that before yet. 
Yeah, so the way Barnard does it with uh, admissions is the student interviewers are current senior students at Barnard College, and the reason for that being is because we do have such an emphasis on who this person is, would your attitude fit with the school? The way I always say is that when you walk onto a campus, you have a conversation with the atmosphere, and it's kind of like that awkward first date where you try to figure out if you get along, is this going to work, is this going to vibe, and if it doesn't, that no matter how good the school is that you're applying to, that's something worth listening to because you're going to be there for four years of your life. And it's not worth being at a place just for a name or just because you've got pressure to be there if you're not going to be happy there. Four years is a very long time. That being said, it goes incredibly quickly. I feel as if I walked on campus yesterday. I'm sure being a junior yourself, you can't even imagine entering into your junior year. But it's like halfway done. I'm like, what? It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I was just doing Gen Ed. It's like, what yeah. even? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think the reason they're using senior students is because at Barnard we have a better understanding of what it, the experience is as a student so we can answer a lot more of those questions for our high school seniors. And because we are so in tune with the, the attitude that Barnard has, we're able to better gauge whether or not the student is a good fit for the school. Because at the end of the day, since the school is so small, we really want students here that just are ready to hit the world running. They're ready to go. They're ready to be passionate about something. And there are a lot of students out there who have fantastic scores, but they don't necessarily have the well-rounded personality behind it. And vice versa. There are some phenomenal people out there that just don't test well. And those are things worth considering in Barnard's eyes. I'm one of those people. I can't test for life for me. And it, it's got <laughs> absolutely nothing. What's crazy is it has nothing to do with your intelligence. Absolutely no. nothing. It's just the second the exam's in front of you, it falls out the window. Yeah, no, I'm the biggest advocate of that. I had one interview. Um, the lady looked at me. She's like, you know, if there's one thing you could say in front of our admissions board, what would it be? I'm like, don't look at me for the number that's on my SAT or ACT reports. I'm so much more of a student than that. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many factors with that. I'm more of a methodical person. The ICT, ACT is, you know, get all this done in a certain amount of time and hopefully you do well. Right. And I'm just like, that is, that's anti-me. I take my time. I'm like the slowest test taker. Like <laughs> when it comes to like big assembly exams that I have at school, it's just like, you know, I'm like one of the last people out there. And they give, they give us yeah. two hours, just a normal exam. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone's different, and I think these exams are changing to kind of, you know, the SATs, right. you know, change and become more like the ACT, mm -hmm. and I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot of changes in regards to that. I hope so. I think it's a phenomenal place to be moving towards. The biggest advice, though, that I would definitely give to students and when applying to anywhere, not just Barnard, uh, which you do have to be female, it is all women, by the way, to apply to Barnard. I'd no boys. Boys aren't anywhere. allowed. <laughs> not in here. You're more than welcome across the street, though, <laughs> um, but... At Barnard, one of the really important things, or anywhere in general, is just to be passionate about something, no matter what it may be. One of my closest friends, who is actually a physics major doubling with neuro, so this woman is brilliant, blows my mind, uh, she is a very passionate knitter. That's what she wrote about for her essay. And it's something that she's really, really into. Another friend of mine just took a year off to work at NASA because she could before entering her No gym. big deal. No big deal at all. <laughs> so, but it, it, those are the people that really surround us here, which is really great. And that's something that is a really big asset as a high schooler applying. If you have something that you're passionate about, whether it be knitting or whether it be aliens at NASA, whatever it may be, <laughs> just to kind of have that. For myself, it was my sport. Uh, I am captain of our national martial arts team. So that cool. was... <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so that was something that I was really passionate about and something that took up a lot of my time through high school. But just having that thing that just kind of... It doesn't even have to separate you. I wouldn't worry about that, but rather that you light up when talking about it and makes you that much more interesting. That That's worth so much more than five more points on an SAT in my mind. <laughs> It's no, that's completely true. Like I wrote in my essay, and it was I was fortunate enough to you know was able to fit in a lot of the essay topics when I applied were kind of the same. Mm -hmm. So I was able to use like one essay for a majority of them. And I wrote about a horse I had worked with, and it was just like you know that was me. And I worked with so many other essay topics. Like one I was writing, I'd gone hiking for a week once, and mm -hmm. a bear got into our food, oh, wow. and I <laughs> made a metaphor with that. It just wasn't the best essay <laughs> in the world. It was different. Yep. <laughs> it probably got some attention. But, um, you know, the one where I wrote about the horse is just, you know, that was me. That defined right. me, and that was my passion, and that just showed a side of me that you weren't going to get from numbers, so. Exactly, exactly, and that's that's so important. I mean, that's the first thing we hit upon when we're interviewing high school seniors here. It's what, what are you passionate about? What makes you move forward in a day? And that's definitely something, if you don't have an answer yet, people should probably start thinking about. 
Now, when you're going through your application, you have you, know, you have your academics, you have your all your statistics, but there's also besides also you know the essay provides obviously who you are, but there's mm -hmm. also the extracurriculars. It shows you what you're passionate about. What were some of the extracurriculars you were involved in? I was relatively busy through high school, so obviously you know we have the National Honor Society, the NHS, that a lot of students tend to do. That was a lot of fun. We also had a foreign language honor society, which was really cool. Uh, honestly, though, a lot of my time was spent with martial arts. I was training five to six hours a day after high school, uh, and then on top of that, holding an AP load. It was rough. There were times where you kind of want to take a break. What's great about high school is you can, though. Your weekends are off, which is something I miss so much. But <laughs> it, a lot of my time was either spent with working with an international population. Both my parents are from France, but I grew up and lived in New York my whole life. So because of that, though, I understood the dynamic of what it was to have an international perspective, to have that culture shock occur for a lot of students. And so I worked quite a bit with a lot of our foreign culture clubs, which was a lot of fun. And it got, I got to meet some students I wouldn't have met otherwise, which are phenomenal people that I'm still in touch with. And that, along with martial arts, and I played the piano for a bit, those almost three to four aspects really kind of circled most of my high school life. No, it's interesting, you know, especially that you're so involved in martial arts that, you know, that makes you really different. And that makes you know, <laughs> you know, it's not it's not something you see on every application and someone, you know, is captain of their now you're captain of your college team and right. it's you know, it's something you can carry on through. Not only are they seeing that you're doing it in high school, they're saying, Oh, well you can be involved at Barnard as well doing that too. So Exactly. It carries through. And a lot of colleges want to see that. So they kind of want to look at application. What are you doing now that you can also do in college and have an impact on the student body there as well? Exactly. Exactly. It's a really big part of it. Also, just how involved are you? Are you someone who's going to passively sit there and watch your community go by, or are you going to actively decide to take the bull by the horns and run in and make a difference? Yeah. Now, when it came to making your decision, obviously, you know, acceptance letters are nerve-wracking, they're exciting, it's a whole bunch of emotions that you just can't even begin to explain. Mm -hmm. When you got your Barnard acceptance, what were you thinking? I was so excited, so excited. Now one of the very odd things for me when I was applying to colleges is I had a few schools that were on my top list and then I had others that you know I was applying to just to see and have a safety and a background. Barnard was kind of in that mid-ground for me at the beginning because I hadn't visited yet. It was in that place where it was on the list of a place I would really want to go but because it was so small, I didn't know enough about it to really make it one of my top choices. And so when I got into Barnard, I was really excited. I was really happy. And I visited the school. And it was one of those things where I walked on campus. I spoke to about two students and just sat down, looked at my parents and said, so where do I sign up? How does this work? Where do we accept the acceptance, in short? And so that, to me, became the moment when I start to understand who I was going to be surrounded by that I really fell in love with the college in general. But the acceptance letter when I received it, there was, I mean, any acceptance, there's a moment of just, I'm okay, I'm going to go somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to college. Everything is fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then from there, my biggest advice is once you, once you start getting into places, and every student has this, you have a place that's your dream school, and no matter what happens, you sit there and you say, well, that's where I'm going to go to school. Visit everywhere. Because Barnard was not that school for me at the beginning, just because I didn't know enough about it. But the second I visited it, just jumped to the top of my list. So visiting was a really, really big process for me in terms of figuring out where to go. No, that's that's yeah. great. I mean, I think there was definitely a lot of smaller colleges that, you know, they were out of state. We couldn't, you know, go fly and visit that I probably, if I had taken the time to go and see them, I'd be like, oh, you know, this could be an option. Mm -hmm. now, Financial-wise, maybe not have been, but in yeah. my mind it was. Yeah. <laughs> that's also a very, that's a really good point. Any of the international, or not even international, but out-of-state schools that people are applying to, at which point, not something that now I know working in admissions I didn't know when applying but can be very helpful, you are more than welcome to reach out and speak to an admissions counselor upon coming in and getting a feel for that. The people who work in admissions are generally speaking a really good sense of what type of school this is and what I would ask to speak to is not necessarily just the people who are employed there but a student who's employed there because they are going to give you the real story. Students, we're not set on selling someone to go somewhere because we only want students at our university and colleges that fit our university and colleges. So if someone's not a good fit, we're not going to drag you here just because we love it. 
but at the end of the day, you want everyone to be happy. So that's if you do apply to a school and you get into a school which is out of state, I would suggest calling and asking to speak to an available student because that's really the best way you're going to get a feel without visiting for what this place is. And that'll apply to pretty much every college or university. Yeah. Almost every admissions office has students working in there. I mean, yeah. the people giving tours, those are students. You know, exactly. so definitely, I would definitely encourage students to go and call the admissions office to get a good sense of it. I mean, you call University of Georgia, you're going to get a southern accent saying, hi, y'all. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, it all differs. And, you know, if you're from up north, and that's going to be a bit of a culture shock for you. So yeah. it's definitely a good <laughs> way of seeing how it works. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's also, we love speaking to students. We love it. It's really exciting because we, if someone's working in admissions, they probably like where they are. So you'll get a really good sense of the school from a positive sense, which is nice before showing up and entering in any capacity. Now, being in New York City, Barnard, Bernard is, um, you know, you've got a lot of options in regards to food. <laughs> now, if a, pers a prospective student was to come in and, you know, tour the campus, where's one place they have to go and eat? Like, p food is mandatory in life. Oh, it is. My life hard. revolves around it. It's great. Where yep. should people eat? <laughs> Wholeheartedly. We have a few really great places. There's two that I'm going to recommend based on whatever people want. One is the Hungarian Pastry Shop. That one is on about 112th and Amsterdam. So uh, Barnard and Columbia are both on 116th and Broadway just on either side. Essentially, if you walk through Columbia University's campus and then turn right and go for a bit, you will find it without a problem. It is this very... I don't want to use the word hipster, but I'm going to have to type of cafe <laughs> where they have just the most delicious pastries and food and their coffee is phenomenal and if you're not into coffee I suggest strongly their hot chocolate they are great another place is if you're visiting that one I would take your family and parents to because it's just a it's and you'll also see a lot of students there by the way so you'll get a really good feel for what type of student goes to Columbia and Barnard but if you are here with friends or if you're visiting overnight and you just have a late night where you just sit there and you go, I want some junk food right now. I would suggest Coronets. Coronets is a pizza shop where you can get a slice of pizza about the size of my head for about a dollar fifty, maybe two dollars. So it is massive and it is definitely for those junk food heavier nights because it's not lacking in grease. But it's also a really big experience of the Barnard College in New York City life. Oh, hey, I feel like if you're in New York City and you don't get pizza, you're failing. You're not you doing it right. Your trip. You failed your trip. Just <laughs> No. You just turn around at that point. <laughs> yeah, just go home. Just leave. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Claire, it was great talking to you. Thank you for talking to us. You know, you gave a lot of insight about the missions process of Barnard, too. Um, cool. Thank you. Tons of information that will help a lot of these high school students will get a lot out of. I hope so. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> and everybody, <laughs> tune into our next episode. Bye. <laughs>